Louis Gazetua, Miami lobbyist, law firm Gazetua Letelier. Louis, thanks so much for finding time to join us on the Ivy Podcast this afternoon. I understand you're based here in South Florida as well, right? Born and raised in Miami. South Florida is a region and it's something we all aspire to, but Miami's Miami, 100%. That's so cool. You, you don't meet that many native Floridians these days. And especially, you know, something that I want to talk to you about further on the podcast is some of the initiatives in place that really helped kind of position South Florida as that technology hub, the innovation hub center, you know, throughout the states. So that's very exciting. Um, but before we jump into that, can you give us a thumbnail version of your career, kind of the timeline, key accomplishments would be happy to, uh, to get to know that a little bit better. Well, I'm, I'm 45, as I indicated, born and raised and educated here in Miami. Uh, my professional career actually started with a startup, I guess, before startups were cool in the 90s. Uh, this was a company that would bring uh, patients from Latin America that would pay uh, you know, high net worth patients that would pay uh, for the cash value of their medical services here in the United States. And we were a, a patient logistics company, and I was their director of marketing. But you know, as I did that for a while, and um, you know, being the grandson and son of immigrants, uh, you were always told you should either be a doctor or a lawyer. So uh, I decided to go to law school. Uh, just I thought it was a more effective route, and I was more interested in business. And I thought I could be a business lawyer, and I went to law school. Um, here at St. Thomas University School of Law. It's a Catholic law school. And uh, immediately after law school, I had a really incredible opportunity to be a law clerk to one of the finest litigators probably in the country. He's a legend, Bob Josephsberg, Pothurst Orsic. And when friends of mine just graduated and they got their first lawyer jobs, they were like suing, uh, you know, car accidents or landlord tenant, really boring stuff. Uh, I had the opportunity to sue the Palestinian Authority for acts of terror against dual citizens in Israel. I had the opportunity to represent hotel developers offshore for alleged hacking uh, of uh, the databases of the premier flags. And while I was doing this, um, I've always believed in volunteering and, and that's how I was raised to give back and get involved and, and be part of something, not, not, not for monetary value, but just to do something. My father, as I may have mentioned, or, or I will mention, he's a deacon in the Catholic Church and his service is being a police chaplain. And uh, in being involved with law enforcement, the police chief decided he wanted to run for county mayor. And my dad says, well, why don't you go volunteer at the campaign office with me? I'm like, dad, I don't like politics. These people, they're a nightmare. It's a <laughs> mission. That's a phrase we say here in Miami, which I, I think everybody will start using because it is a mission. Uh, and I said, okay, dad, I'll go. And I got along with these guys so good. And uh, I ended up being their pro bono lawyer for the campaign. And at 28 years old, this guy who was like in last place and nobody gave a shot, uh, I was 28. Uh, the police chief was obviously older. He ended up becoming the mayor of Miami Dade. And uh, the young lawyer was brought in to be the new mayor's young lawyer. And that's how it all started. Wow, that's super exciting, and I appreciate you sharing a little bit more about your background. Very, very, uh, very diverse, uh, so to say. In terms of what are you currently working on, what currently keeps you busy, tell us a little bit more about kind of the from Miami lobbyist perspective, or even that procurement attorney. It's mm -hmm. you know it's not something that's so widely as you know known in terms of the the role that you play or responsibilities or some of the strategies you have. Uh, share with us a little bit more about that. So, you know, uh, it's, it's really interesting. When people think of lobbyists, they think of DC lobbyists or state capital lobbyists. And those guys are totally different than what I do. Um, those guys, your gals, what they do is they go, they either are uh, lobbying on, on behalf of issues associated with interest groups or for, uh, you know, what were called traditionally EMAR, earmarks, which necessarily don't have it, but funding for projects or, or funding for certain issues. I don't do that at all. What I do uh, is very specific. It's, a, it's focused on business development. So I support and I represent as a targeted arm of business development, major uh, companies, these are large companies. And when they 
decide that they want to pursue an opportunity in local government. It could be uh, a, a new bridge, a new jail. These, these, are, these projects are generally hundreds of millions of dollars. We get engaged early in the process, and I can share with you the pro procurement process, how it works, if you're interested. And we get engaged early in the process, and we go through the whole continuum of interest in an opportunity to closing the opportunity in government. This could take 18 months. So we're engaged month to month, obviously, well, you know, you want to be engaged the whole time, but um, navigating them through the process. So it, it's business development. It's legal because there is a period in the procurement where you cannot communicate. And there's also a sales component to it. And at the end, it's the lobbying, the aggressive lobbying if needed. But if you did all your work up here, it's just like touch lobbying to make sure everything's worked out. Oh, well, that's very interesting um, and definitely unique in the sense as a comparison to the business development that we're operating your business in a sense. Uh, it definitely makes a lot more sense. So appreciate that insight. And obviously you're involved in, you know, in a lot of different uh, initiatives here in South Florida. What are the different trends that or ideas that really excite you these days? What is, what is something that you personally researching? looking to invest in further, share with us what's, uh, what's, what are you passionate about? So I'm excited for all the great work that our mayor and, you know, our friend, because we're all in the same age group, um, Francis Suarez is doing. He really found his niche globally, forget locally, in, in, in asking how can I help? And it's really evolved into a vision to make Miami the capital of capital. And he's doing such a great job convening all these, these folks, being people that are startups to the portfolio of VCs and funders, not founders that he has available to them. And they're connecting the dots. I had an incredible breakfast this morning with some of these folks. And we're just talking about how these people are flowing through. So I'm excited about that he's doing that. I'm really excited also about being very intentional about ensuring that the local folks who, who are smaller, because we have some really impactful people that were the pioneers of this in this community, but the, the smaller startups, the, the younger people, the, the tech kids of Miami, the tech young people of Miami, that they have a seat at the table. I wanna make sure also that our small business enterprises, uh, that those are classifications in local government can serve these big opportunities. Because I think if we create that type of environment, and I'm not going to use any of the key words that, that are said too frequently, but if we create an environment where all can participate, this will grow and it'll be sustainable. It won't be a, a community where locusts come and eat everything up and leave. So I think it's something that we can do. And I, and I think we're going to be really successful at it. We have a plan. Absolutely. Those definitely are exciting trends, especially these days coming out of pandemic, virtual world and looking at the future of work and hybrid environments. A lot of companies are structuring. It's definitely exciting um, in terms of building and fostering that ecosystem of innovation here in South Florida. You mentioned you you partner a lot with Mayor Suarez on quite a few initiatives, which, you know, we've we've all heard quite a quite a bit in the media these days a lot of very exciting uh projects underway share with us any of those initiatives that really contribute or foster the that culture of innovation here in south florida well i think i think we all partner it's not an exclusive relationship by any any way whatsoever he's just a wonderful person and his door is open and his and he texts people and he puts his cell phone out there I'm always so impressed as a lobbyist when elected officials give people their cell phone, like on Twitter. Uh, but he's, he's really a generous and beautiful person for doing that. What's exciting right now? I think, I think what's really exciting uh, is, is the investments at the Knight Foundation, who, who really were kind of the spark of this, this movement, uh, along with the Medina family who, who created eMERGE, the conveners, that all their work has really come together. They put in all that work for years. I remember going to the first eMERGE and saying, well, what the heck is this thing? I mean, you know, who's showing up for this? And then all of a sudden now it's going to be one of the most relevant <laughs> tech conferences in the world once they have it next year, when they, they pause it because of COVID, which is smart because you want to have a great event. 
uh, the Knight Foundation too. The Knight Foundation started investing in these companies, investing kind of in these little innovation centers, which created all the, all the leaders that we have now. Well, now the Knight Foundation's inventing, investing into our universities because they're creating the talent pool, which I know and I'm sure we're gonna have to talk about. They're creating that talent pool at Miami, uh, Miami Dade College, FIU, which I'm involved with as the um, chairman of the engagement council under Mr. Saifi Shouf, who's the executive, uh, the vice president of, of that department. We're doing all this stuff because we wanna make sure that our talent is ready because this thing's going pretty fast, but we also have to be sustainable. In the short term, last night we had one of these clubhouse things, which I don't mean to sound like an old guy or un viejo, but the, the truth is that it's really kind of weird, but interesting too, because you have these great conversations and it's still this whole new thing that has this ugly UI that looks like base camp, but nonetheless, everybody's talking, you know? And um, Career Source South Florida, we had last night Rick Beasley, who is the future head of our chamber, but he runs this, this agency. They are creating accelerated programs to fund uh, the hiring of staff and the retraining of staff. These are, these are public dollars, you're, they're available to accelerate training them within your new organization. So if you're a VC or a tech company that's moving here, you have a specialized area of need on the tech side or journalism or whatever, they will fund the first couple months of their, of their job down here in order to, to soften the blow of the relocation. Another really exciting thing, if you read the Miami Herald uh, today, is, uh, is what the DDA is doing under my, my friend, Nit Montwani, who I've known for many years when he first relocated here. He is the developer of uh, World Center Miami, and he's uh, not the chair right now, but he's one of the senior board members of the DDA. They've created a fund to help uh, technology and finance firms relocate into downtown Miami because we want to create those types of jobs in the urban core. The folks coming here love live, work, play. Us, you know, we want a little more space. Uh, some of the old Miami folks, we still want our own swimming pool. We don't want to share. But, you know, the, these folks, he's created these programs. They're doing $150,000 grants now to a multi-million, multi-billion dollar company. It's not a big deal. But guess what? That's a down payment on your lease. So they're doing all these, these wonderful grants. I'm really excited about everybody's doing. Everybody's in. Everybody's in. And back to Mayor Suarez, who is everybody's thought leader and friend, our promoter in chief, he created a hub. He created the destination where you get pointed out to all these through Venture Miami. And that's being led by a, a friend, an old friend, you know, from many, many years ago and a great philanthropist and someone who just really doesn't need to work anymore, but he just cares about this community so much. Saifi Shouf and the mayor and, uh, you know, uh, Kevin uh, from the DDAs there, they're all doing great work. We're, we're open and we want to help. Well, that's very exciting. And some of these initiatives are definitely, definitely transformational for, you know, the ecosystem here in South Florida and just in general, the, the, the tech scene, which is super exciting. Um, when, when it comes to companies that are considering relocation to South Florida, opening some satellite offices or even the headquarters, we've seen, you know, seen quite, quite a few of those lately, especially from whether from Silicon Valley or for whatever, whatever the case may be. Can, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the, the challenges that these companies face as they, as they decide to relocate here to South Florida, what are, what are some of the pitfalls to avoid to make that transitional a little bit smoother? Well, I think, you know, let's talk about challenges and then let's talk about opportunities. Mm -hmm. Challenges is that you're moving here when, even before, how can I help and, and, and Mayor Suarez's vision and, and spark of all the hard work of everybody I mentioned before, the Medinas, the Emerge, Knight Foundation, Matt Hagman, who was, who was at Knight Foundation, is now Beacon Council. Everybody wanted to have a house with a pool because of the pandemic. So our real estate market get, catches on fire and then now it's really on fire. And our commercial space never died. So number one of the challenges is figure out where to live and where to work. Remote helps, but at the end of the day, look, I go to the office four days a week. Uh, I'm meeting with people. I'll meet with people outside if they're preferred. I mean, in Florida, you can get a vaccination at Publix, for Christ's sake. I know they try to knock our wonderful governor for that, but they're crazy. You can show up to a CVS and you get a shot. 
You get shots everywhere. We're giving them out. Okay, so the number one is where. Where do I live? What do I do? How do I do it? So, you know, there's some great resources and some cool kids and cats online and on Twitter that are helping people with that. Obviously, I'm not a realtor, but I mean, you know, if you can give me a call and make some suggestions. Another thing we notice is that a lot of these folks were trying to, where do I send my kid to school? It's a big deal. You know, these people relocating from New York. So there's a, all kinds of resources for that are, you know, these people that are, that are higher end net worth, our elite schools really uh, pride themselves on capping the numbers. So that's a challenge for them to figure out, but there's a lot of options here. Uh, believe it or not, uh, our public school system, I'm not saying that that's the, what they want to do, but we have one of the finest public school systems in the country. Our superintendent, Alberto Carvalho, is a, I think he's a repeated recipient of the Broad Prize. He's been acknowledged by multiple presidents. He's been quartered to be the secretary of education. He's turned it down because he's so smart. He'd rather stay here. And, and he was right. Everybody wants to be here now. We have, this is the home base of one of the finest charter school systems in the country, Academica. So that's an opportunity here to look at. And then again, we have these really elite schools where most of our heads of schools came from the Northeast. Uh, the other challenge is talent. We talked about that a minute ago. You know, again, we, it's tough to find people. I have found that clients that I, I represent VCs that are relocating here, uh, we, we have to go a little bit uh, kind of like commando, go out on our own and try and figure out, you know, find the people on our own, hit the universities, make the calls to professors and executives and all that. that that's that for now. But through the FIU engagement and TDN, which is the Talent Development Network, we're providing uh, pathways to employment through paid internships and all these things. So those are wonderful things that you can look at. Uh, another challenge is there, there, there really isn't a financial challenge for these people moving here because they have great wealth, but there are incentives uh, that are available. And I'm happy to either provide a link or, or send you all a memo uh, for you to stick in the, the YouTube or whatever in the chat uh, that, that you have for this. So it kind of, it's just a quick roadmap. Uh, they can figure it out of what's out there. But the greatest incentive to be here, obviously, is to track the tax structure. Uh, you know, you're going to be paying 20% less taxes here. Your, your taxes will be based on property taxes. So, you know, depends on the house you buy is how much you're going to pay. So, and once you're in, you're locked in uh, with, a, with a small increment every year. There's no surprises on, on, uh, on, uh, home, on your home, not on, on your commercial property. So those are the challenges, I think, and opportunities. That makes sense. And mo just recently, my business partner was on a cafecito talk with Mary Soares. And one of the main topics that they really touched upon is that war for talent out there, which is which is real. This is the space where we operate in through our companies. We, we specialize in that, whether that's technology or helping other companies find the tech talent. Um, and good portion of our audience on the Ivy podcast are, you know, the executives, whether that's Fortune 500, you know, GPs and the founders of venture funds, they all agree on that one thing that's, you know, the talent scarcity, talent, war for talent is, is real. Uh, and one of the major challenges for companies, whether locally or virtually, uh, to find that right type of skill set for their organizations. And you touched upon a little bit something on the strategies where you partner with some universities and some of the opportunities to for retraining or basically developing some of that talent, which is super exciting. Um, any other thoughts that you want to share around the, you know, especially around the technology, because South Florida, you know, is not so well known when it comes to tech talent. And we continuously get scrutinized, especially in the media, that, you know, for the tech companies that relocate the you know, the availability of talent is not as diverse as other huge markets, which, you know, I have my own thoughts around that, but curious to get your opinion on that. Well, you know, look, again, it, it's, it's first off, talent in itself right now is a challenge. I mean, these people that they want are specialized individuals, but right now there's because of the, the current benefits uh, uh, provided by some of the, the COVID relief, there's really no incentive to work. So people are operating at 60% of their staff, just even based on, you know, on the service industry. So you can imagine in the high tech industry. So to get the talent, you're going to have to incentivize them. Fortunately, in your business, people are so sophisticated that they don't have to be local, at least in the beginning. 
while we're working on this. So keep keep a lot of these New York people in New York. It's okay. They don't have to come down here. So they, they can stay there. They can work from there and be happy in their city. Um, so that's that's the solution that they'd have to do right now. But we're we're building it, and they can rest assured. I mean, they you know they they tried to come up with this Silicon Beach phrase for us. We never wanted to be Silicon Beach. We're Miami. Okay, we don't need anything of that. We don't want it. We are our own place. And uh, we're gonna invite you here and we want you to help us keep Miami, Miami because we're our own thing. And I think they'll be able to really be successful here if the owners and founders move here and they have an organic growth while leveraging remote workers from other places. Our kids in the university through our internship programs, which we encourage them to be paid, um, will be feeding into these companies as they grow in our community. Right, absolutely. Having that very, you know, unique, strong sense of identity, I think, is very important, especially for you know for our market. In um, from your personal perspective, obviously, you 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 have to stay up to date on a lot of the different trends and uh, market conditions and things like that that are going on. What is your personal content diet looks like? What do you consume on daily basis? What are your sources of information or your sources for learning? So um, Wall Street Journal is the only news I read. Uh, I monitor the Miami Herald government section uh, just to be aware of maybe trends or political things because I am a lobbyist. I need to know what's going on. Uh, the Twitter handle of Doug Hanks, who is the reporter for uh, local government news, is very helpful. I um, listen to audiobooks because, you know, we're walking around, you're work well, working out, you really got to be focused, but you're walking around, you're going to meetings. Uh, audiobooks are helpful. Um, like right now, I'm listening to John Boehner's book, which is hilarious. Uh, the only thing is you feel like having a drink when you listen to him speak because he's so relaxed. You could you could see him having a glass of wine while doing the audiobook. Uh, podcasts, uh, podcasts are more junk food for me. Uh, like I'll listen to the rewatchables. Uh, uh, they, they they go over the movies and they're so funny. I, I they'd be so mad I forgot their podcast channel. Uh, I listen to new rock stars or I watch them on on YouTube for all the secret tips on the Marvel movies and the TV shows. I love all that all that stuff. And I, and I like to listen to Potomac Watch, which is the Wall Street Journal editorial board. They're really good and they're pretty honest and to the point and they share my values. So uh, they're very helpful as well. That's super cool. And for our audience, we'll make some of those links and titles available in the episode notes. Uh, and in closure, Louis, what is one book that you always recommend to others and why is that? It's a lot of work because it's like this, uh, it would be Lyndon Johnson, Path to Power. Mm -hmm. Incredible book. That's great. It's one in a series, but that's where the real exciting stuff happens. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's great. I'm definitely going to add that to my growing list of, of books that I have to read. Uh, Louis, if anyone wanted to connect with you or find you, what's the best way to do that? They can visit gazetua.com. That is the firm website. And there they can fill things out and just find me or LinkedIn, which it's crazy how relevant it's become. Right. We all would make fun of LinkedIn and now LinkedIn's like the most relevant place to meet people. And I think it'll stay that way. Mm -hmm. And it's a safe place with no con no politics, no judgment, no ugliness. It's just business. So I think it's a good place to be too. Outstanding. Well, I can't thank you enough for your time today. It was a very short and powerful conversation. Personally, learned quite a bit. Definitely going to stay in touch with you. And I'm sure we're going to cross paths at some of the events that are coming up. And perhaps we can do another episode in a year and see how much have changed, transpired uh, in the meantime. I appreciate it. And make sure to get your shot.